Hello there ladies and gentlemen and welcome to another of the pre-auction uh, metal department videos. Uh, we are obviously running relatively tight to the uh, auction which will happen on the 21st of July um, but we have been putting together uh, what I think is one of um, the best catalogues of the last few years actually. It's a bit of a knockout. Um, whilst I was away, um, Robert and Harry were obviously beavering away and I may as well start, because you've all got the, you've all got the uh, catalogue with you at home now, um, with the front cover lot. Um, with it being July, uh, we thought we'd save this, this cross for the summer, and um, obviously on the anniversary uh, there was a lovely half page spread uh, in the Times here in the UK, uh, all about this absolutely remarkable first day of the Battle of the Somme, Victoria Cross group of 10. Uh, this group is awarded to drum major, major Ritchie, uh, of the Seaforth Highlanders, and I will very carefully pop it back down. Uh, he was a long-served uh, regular soldier. He would enlisted in 1908, uh, and by the time of 1914, um, when he went off to war, he was still in the rank of drummer, uh, which is rather charming. So his, his 14 star uh, and his pair are, are named him as a drummer. And he was wounded in action for the first time during 1914, and by the time of July 1916, uh, he, he was there with his unit and despite his uh, rank of drummer, uh, his musical instrument of choice was actually the bugle and you see the front cover and you see the gallant Ritchie playing the drum, um, but that was uh, an artistic license uh, used incorrectly uh, in this full page colour plate that was actually used in Deeds That Thrill the Empire, one of the few colour plates uh, in the two volume production. Um, John Ritchie during the day um, played the charge on his bugle on a number of occasions mounting the enemy parapet. Uh, he drew machine gun fire towards him uh, after a number of attacks had been become disorganized. Um, huge amounts of officers and men were mown down and um, we've also got the image uh, of the roll call of his battalion uh, that afternoon and very few of them were able and standing to answer the call. Um, the cross has been off the market down in Australia for a number of years. Um, the last been seen at auction in the 1970s and in the 1980s. So again, it's one of the, those rare opportunities to acquire uh, a Great War Victoria cross. Uh, better than that, uh, there's obviously just nine VCs available for the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And with uh, the recent sale around five years ago of the last example, um, at that point there were only three crosses available in private, you know, available for private buyers, and now this makes it just two available. So, a really, really rare opportunity to get your hands on a first day of the Battle of the Somme uh, Victoria Cross Group. Uh, Richie, as you can see from his his plethora of decorations. Uh, and other awards. He earned himself a uh, French Croix de Guerre by the end of the war. By that time he'd been wounded no less than five times in action. Uh, he then re-enlisted for the Second World War uh, and as you can see he, he earned the 3945 and a war medal uh, and I think the rather charming um, coronation and jubilee medal that you see in there uh, is the 1953 Coronation Medal. Uh, so in this year of the Jubilee, it's rather fitting that we are offering a VC group to a man who not only uh, won his, his cross under the reign of King George V, um, he earned the Coronation Medal of King George VI, and obviously uh, Her Majesty the Queen. Um, a few other, other tidbits on, on Ritchie. Uh, he was one of the uh, VC winners who was chosen to provide the Guard of Honour for the Unknown Warrior um, upon the burial at Westminster, um, Westminster Abbey and it's, it's just an absolutely cracking group. Uh, it's one that we've really enjoyed um, researching, working on and hopefully uh, the readers and the bidders will agree next Thursday. So that's going to be sold in a lot 186, so probably about noon that one will come up and it carries a pre-sale estimate of 240 to 280,000 um, pounds. Obviously, we're following on from the world record breaking result of squadron leader Arthur Scarf's Victoria Cross, uh, which we had the pleasure to sell in April. And so, much like London buses, um, we've got another Victoria Cross uh, in this sale. And it's, it's been a great privilege to um, work with the present owner. 
and um, to bring it to bring it for sale. So uh, even if you're not going to be bidding on it, please do go and read the story. It's a huge slice of history and um, an incredibly hard won Victoria Cross. And um, you know we have very high hopes for it, and um, you know I hope to see you there on the day. So. We'll go from one hero of the Great War, and I'd like to talk to you about another one, uh, but not one serving in the British Army, uh, one serving with the Aussies. And this is the, uh, not showing obviously, uh, we have those uh, illustrated for you, uh, the KCB, KCMG um, group to Lieutenant General uh, J.T.T. Hobbs, Australian Imperial Force. Uh, Hobbs was, a, was born in this country, uh, he was a mad keen artilleryman by all accounts and having gone off to Western Australia to make his fortune uh, after the gold rush and the, um, the building of the city of Perth, um, he was one of the, its key architects uh, and his, his, uh, his skills are seen all over the city in, in buildings which remain there to this day, a number of them uh, listed, uh, listed monuments uh, in their own rights. Um, Hobbes was able to serve in the Western Australian artillery in the contingent, pre-Federation obviously, um, and whenever uh, work and finances allowed, which was thankfully for him relatively often, uh, he would come back uh, at his own expense and go down you know, to Larkhill, Salisbury, those sort of places, and join the Royal Artillery and learn everything that was going on with new developments in, in gunnery. So at the outbreak of the Great War, he was the man selected uh, to lead the first Australian artillery contingent and of course they went off to Gallipoli. Hobbs landed there on the first day and he was absolutely seminal in the planning and execution of artillery operations on the peninsula. Uh, he was extremely well regarded by his men. He wasn't afraid to clash with those above him um, in terms of where he was placing his guns and the conditions his men were working under. And he spent his whole period, um, you know, the whole period from, from the first landings all the way through 1915 before the evacuation. Uh, and despite one short um, interlude where he had to go off to uh, receive treatment for, for very bad dysentery, uh, he was only away for five or six days from his post. Uh, he got himself a promotion and he was awarded the CB. Um, however, the story goes on from there. He then found himself transferred to the Western Front, promoted in rank, uh, and he is one of the key players um, for the Australian forces on the Western Front. Um, you know, he really ranks up there with the commanding officers of the Australian Imperial Force, uh, and without doubt, this is one of the most important uh, Aussie commanders groups uh, which has ever or will ever come up onto the market. Um, so it is an absolutely standout group. Uh, by the end of the war, as you can read in the catalogue, uh, he was elevated to Lieutenant General. Uh, he was also KCB, KCMG, as I've said. Uh, he had the rare distinction of earning two Croix de Guerres uh, from the French, something which is quite fun and has actually been documented because when he received the second one, he actually wrote back off to the war office and said, what are you doing? I've already got one. And it turned out that the French were so pleased with his work that they, they decorated him a second time obviously the serving order of the White Eagle to boot. Um, an extra fun story about Hobbes is by the time of the end of the Great War, uh, he was commanding the Australian Corps and um, he had the Prince of Wales uh, later, shortly, Edward VIII, um, come to stay with him for, for a number of weeks uh, for Christmas 1918 and after the medal group, uh, there are a number of presentation items uh, from the Prince and lovely, uh, totally unpublished, fresh to market um, manuscript letter um, which gives much detail into the, the relationship the two built. So again a fantastic important group and that's being sold as lot 113 carries a pre-sale estimate of 24 to 28,000 that should be blown out the water uh, and sold by the family so never been on the market and a rare opportunity so don't miss out. Um, I think I'm now going to pass over to Robert who's going to talk about a few of his favourite items in the upcoming sale. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Marcus. So, as I say pretty much on every occasion we do one of these videos, um, as you know, my particular interest is in the Napoleonic Wars, and I have a purely Napoleonic selection uh, to, to show you today. We're going to start off with Lot 50, which is this very, very nice Naval General Service Medal, 
uh, with the clasp for Endymion with President. Now, what makes this particularly special is it comes with this rather charming little silver badge known as a midshipman's badge. It's in the form of a shepherd's crook and that is uh, an allusion to um, Greek mythology with Endymion being a shepherd. And the story behind this is really, really rather fascinating and I'm going to refer to the family that this came from in a little while because this medal has been with the family since it was awarded and young James Yule was a junior officer on board the frigate HMS Endymion when it fought the USS President in one of the last naval engagements of the War of 1812. And it was a fascinating battle because the, uh, the British really gave the Americans what for in a very unusual occurrence in a way because the Americans had, uh, had defeated the British at sea far more times than we had defeated them during the War of 1812. Um, but by 1814, with this particular action, um, the British had got into their stride. The Royal Navy was not going to be surprised by the standard of American seamanship and gunnery. And so this was a very, very well fought action by the Royal Navy, which resulted in the, in the capture of the American frigate. But again, not necessarily without some controversy because during the battle, uh, the American captain, uh, Captain Decatur, actually surrendered uh, to Captain Hope of the Endymion. Uh, but then when the ships hove to to repair, uh, the Endymion couldn't immediately send anyone over to, to take possession of the American ship because all the ship's boats were damaged. Now, Captain Decatur, uh, when he realized this, uh, they, he actually made sail and tried to escape which is very much not the done thing and, and certainly rather unsporting. Um, but uh, thankfully, there were other British uh, ships in the vicinity who overhauled the president, which then surrendered for a second time. But the American captain did then insist on surrendering to the Endymion only because that was the ship that he had fought mostly against. And so it was a very celebrated victory. And uh, the president was taken back uh, to great acclaim to, to Britain, and it was there that all the officers of the Endymion were presented with these little badges, these, these shepherd's crooks. And this one, I think, is also rather charming because it clearly is on the original um, fabric from which it was likely worn from a buttonhole on James Yule's uniform. Uh, so it doesn't really get more emotive than that. And what was also quite nice is in the course of my write-up and research, I discovered, and you can read about this in the catalogue, an actual quote from James Yule about the awarding of this badge, which was used in um, a book about uh, stirring medals and battles written in the late Victorian era. So I think it's a really wonderful thing, and there were paintings uh, painted of the battle in, in the years afterwards, and uh, I really had a lot of fun researching this particular lot. And so it's a very rare pairing indeed. You don't often find the two together. It comprises, as I say, lot 50 and has an estimate of eight to 10,000 uh, pounds. I'm looking forward to being up on the rostrum to sell this particular lot. And I'm, I'm thoroughly uh, expecting it to go for a good sum and to a, a worthy home. So moving on to the next lot, which is in fact the next lot in the catalog. And uh, not only is it lot 51, which comprises a very fine uh, companion of the Order of the Bath and a small army gold medal, but it's to a member of the same family as the Naval General Service Medal. So this pair was awarded to the, the wonderfully named Major Udney Yule uh, of the East India Company's army. And he received his small gold medal as a junior field officer, as a major, for the invasion of Java in 1811. And therefore, this makes it uh, quite a rare and unusual thing because when one thinks of the gold medals, you pretty much will always think of the Peninsula Wars, for which so many, of course, were given out. But not many were actually presented to officers for this, this little known invasion of Java in 1811. And indeed, people say, well, what on earth were we doing out there? Well, the fact was that Java at that time was in possession of the Dutch. And of course, at that time during the Napoleonic Wars, 
we were very much fighting against the Dutch, who were allied with France, and the idea was to take over as many of their colonial possessions as possible to solidify the, uh, the, uh, the East India Company's possessions and uh, effectively um, keep our trade going without being disrupted by French and Dutch privateers. So it's a wonderful thing. The Order of the Bath is also particularly nice because he was uh, awarded that in 1815. So one of the very first officers to um, be awarded the Order of the Companionship of the Order of the Bath when it was enlarged in 1815 from purely the knights to then companions and grand crosses and all sorts of other things. And um, what is also nice is they are on their original buckles and ribbons, so exactly as worn. And the sort of icing on the cake for me, and again you can see this in the catalogue, is that the medals come with a, a very fine portrait of Major Udney Yule in his uniform and on his uniform chest, you can see him wearing the bath and the small gold medal. So it's a really lovely thing that, again, I had great fun researching, and you can look through the, the catalogue and read all about it. So, as I said, lot 51 after James Yule is Major Udney Yule, and that has an estimate of 15 to 20,000 pounds. Again, we already have some bids on the books, so I'm sure bidding is also going to be pretty spirited for these, and again, I'm looking forward to selling them on the 21st. So finally, to round off my Napoleonic section, we have this very, very nice Military General Service Medal to, for the Peninsula Wars to a private bell of the famous 95th Rifles. Now, that's a regiment that stirs up lots of imagination and emotions. Uh, and um, the 95th, of course, carrying their Baker Rifles, they were involved in all the actions in one form or another of the Peninsula Wars and indeed into Waterloo as well. And this is an 11 clasp MGSM running right through from Vermeera in 1808 through to Toulouse in 1814. So Private Bell was very much in the thick of things throughout the whole of the Napoleonic Wars. And um, from my research, I also believe this to be a unique combination of clasps, not just to the 95th Rifles, but also to the British Army for the Peninsula War. And um, there were, of course, other members of the British Army with 11 class medals, and indeed with more than 11 clasps. But in this combination, I believe it is unique. And that is also very, very exciting. The interesting thing about Private Bell is also that he was a member of what was known as the Highland Company of the 95th Rifles. Now, the Highland Company was formed by a Captain Cameron, of course, a Highlander himself, uh, who raised a company of soldiers in his native Scotland, marched them down to Sussex, joined the 95th. He was therefore made an officer in the regiment, and uh, Private Bell was one of his men. And um, it's interesting to reflect that the Highland Company had such a Scottish flavour that they even carried a set of bagpipes into action, which I believe is unique for a light infantry regiment, uh, certainly at the time, and I think uh, ever since. And the, the Rifles Museum in Winchester still hold the set of bagpipes that were played by the Highland Company in action against the French. And um, it's a wonderful thing. Again, he, he is uh, depicted in a painting uh, that, was, that was painted uh, after the event uh, regarding the retreat to Corona. And again, that's illustrated in the catalogue. So Private Bell's 11 clasp Military General Service Medal to the 95th Rifles comprises lot 123 and has an estimate of three to five thousand pounds. And again, we've got some pre-bidding on the books already. I hope it's going to sail away and do spectacularly. So I think Marcus will be selling that one rather than me, but, uh, but yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing how that does too. So that covers everything I have to talk about uh, in this little video. And I'm now going to hand over to Harry, who will take us through to the end. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, I will start off with lot number 223, the um, fantastic CBCB group of seven with a RMA Santa Sword of Honor awarded to Brigadier General Charles Bradshaw. Um, an interesting figure with an interesting lineage, in fact. Bradshaw is the son of a Lucknow defender uh, and personal friend of Lord Robert Kandahar, um, Major General Alexander Bradshaw. 
The younger Bradshaw uh, received the Sword of Honour in December uh, 1892, uh, on his graduation of course, and then went on to join the Indian Army, um, starting with the 9th Bengal Infantry. Uh, you can see here, saw a good deal of action uh, early on on the northwest frontier with them, uh, and entered the First World War, rather surprisingly, in Aden, uh, as a staff officer attached to the 9th Gurkha Rifles. Uh, it was here that he planned the Sheikh Said raid, um, a raid intended to uh, prevent Ottoman troops from threatening the Persian Gulf, taking the island of Piram, which was uh, strategically situated in the Gulf. Um, apart from planning the raid, he may also have taken part. He certainly boarded with the troops. Uh, but there is also a reference to a mission uh, behind enemy lines to the um, Arab tribes in the area. Uh, intended to ensure them that the raid wasn't targeting them, but was instead targeting the Ottomans. So uh, being a staff officer doesn't necessarily mean planning only. There's certainly a good deal of action there and a great story somewhere. Um, continuing on, he uh, spent a good deal of time in Mesopotamia uh, and was mentioned twice during the war, uh, later mentioned again on the northwest frontier where he served, again, a good deal of action, uh, and at one point was Colonel Commandant of the 9th Gurkha Rifles, uh, finishing up as a Brigadier General. Um, a very interesting group and a good deal to find out there, certainly. That is estimated at £3,600 to £4,000. Moving on to lot 111, uh, a Korean War Group of Four uh, awarded to leading seaman Clifford Skelton, uh, a very tragic group, this one, uh, the only seaman killed in the 20-year history of HMS Cockade, killed during the Korean War uh, on the 30th of November 1951, uh, and he was killed by a, a shot from a shore battery which passed through Y turret and through leading seaman Skelton and then rebounded outside the ship. Um, a really, really poignant group, this, and with a very large archive, including photographs and a letter from the captain uh, to his family. Uh, this really is a, a rare and a very interesting um, group, particularly with the Elizabeth uh, Cross there. Uh, this is estimated at 14 to 1800 pounds. Moving on then to lot 229, the superb MC and Bar DFC group of seven awarded to Major Vacour, uh, Bunny Vacour as he was called, um, this is a really fantastic group uh, and with some superb uh, citations in particular. The MC citations in particular show this man's character as uh, a real daredevil pilot. Um, whether he was an observer in the first, uh, the first award, um, doing barrel rolls and spinning out in thick fog on a reconnaissance mission, or uh, as a pilot with uh, his petrol tank perforated by a bullet, still going to take down uh, an enemy pilot. Um, he was clearly one of the really early pioneers of aerial combat and someone who simply couldn't be kept away from, from the battle. Um, unfortunately killed in uh, a blue-on-blue -blue friendly fire incident um, between himself and an Italian pilot. Um, he is, of course, uh, a recipient of the gold uh, Italian Aeronautic Society Award um, and again a really stunning group with uh, a large, large archive behind it. Um, this group is estimated at 24 to 28,000 uh, pounds and is a, a really spectacular one. Um, well that then is all from us. Uh, thank you very much for listening um, and we will see you bright and early on the 21st. Thank you.